morning from wherever you are joining us from. Uh, my name is Colin Sdundo. I am the interim CEO for the Youth Initiative Development Program. Uh, we would like to wel welcome you all uh, for this discussion. Uh, this is a wonderful discussion. And today's discussion is going to be uh, the role uh, of the youth in advancing and accelerating uh, universal health coverage. So today's question is very important. Uh, maybe for the moment, uh, for the delegates you can digest. How can we inclusively engage the youth uh, as an equal partner in realization of universal uh, health coverage in Africa? So here is the housekeeping rule. Attendees will be on mute uh, during the session. So this session is in English. We are very sorry uh, for those who are coming from Anglophone. We'll, try as much as possible to have an interpretation session. Okay. And we request all uh, to observe allocated time during this discussion. So this session will last for 90 minutes. So let me take a moment and tell you about uh, Youth Initiative Development Program. We are a non-profit uh, organization uh, registered in 2016. So our aim is to empower to inspire and empower vulnerable young people through various programs, through the interventions of uh, poverty relief among the youth, sports, ICT, education, youth health and well-being, stakeholder convening, amongst others. So here is the program for the day. Kindly take a moment and uh, go through it. Thank you. At this time, I would like to invite the moderator for the day, Dr. Mary Claire, over to you. Thank you so much, Collins, for setting the stage and telling us of the ground rules. My name is Dr. Maripia Wangare. I am the convener of the Kenya Medical Association Young Doctors Network and will be moderating this timely discussion on the role of youth in advancing and accelerating UHC in Africa. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel. Um, starting off with um, Dr. Ouma Oluga, who is the former director of uh, health services at Nairobi Metropolitan Service. Um, and I will be highlighting what each of them will be talking about in a few. Um, so maybe Dr. Oluga, you could put on your camera if you've joined us. If not, then I'll move on to introduce our second speaker, who is Dr. Moria Toki, the chief Executive Officer of AHB Health. Um, Dr. Mori, I do know you're with us, so maybe you could just put on your camera and just say a brief uh, hello. Hello there, and the name is Morris Atoki with an S, and the company is ABC Health. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mari Claire. Problem, my apologies for that, yes. Um, next up, um, we do have, uh, Dr. Onesmas Kamala, um, Acting Executive Director of IANASO. Uh, maybe you could just uh, put on your mic and say a uh, brief hello. Uh, sorry, I need to give you like a heads up, Mary. Um, so uh, Onesmas is in Geneva right now. I'm trying to track him down, but he might speak lastly. I will give you a heads up. Sorry about that. All right, uh, that's fine. I'm um, just noted for the slides and then Last but certainly not least, um, Dr. Mohamed um, El Sahili. Hope I got that correct. Um, the Chief Executive Officer of Medland Hospitals. Uh, maybe you could just say hello. Um, Good afternoon to everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, thank you, Marie Claire, for uh, moderating this session. All right. Um, thank you very much. 
Um, without further ado, um, and I stand guided maybe by Collins, I think I'd like us to start off with Dr. Morris uh, Toki, because I have not seen Dr. Oluga online. So maybe we could start off with Dr. Morris Atoki, Chief Executive Officer of ABC Health. Um, and I think the more or less setting the stage by uh, telling us how can we foster partnerships among public and private sectors so as to accelerate the investment opportunities and drive um, the efforts towards health for all. So over to you, Dr. Atoki. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Can you hear me and can you see me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Um, well, thanks, thank you for the question, but um, I, I think that uh, because I have the privilege uh, to be the fourth speaker, um, I think a good uh, to do justice will be uh, fundamentally um, maybe taken also from my fascination about <laughs> the topic, uh, the role of youth in advancing universal health coverage um, in Africa. And, and then how can we inclusively engage youth as they call partners uh, in the realization of this uh, UCH in Africa? Um, I think a great place to start is to remind ourselves um, as members of the panel, also as uh, the audience here today, is what exactly do we mean when we say universal health coverage uh, in, in Africa? And um, I'd like to refer to two publications uh, that was issued in December 20 um, on an article called Towards Universal Health uh, Coverage in Africa. Um, and that article considered um, as a fundamental human right. Uh, the sad truth is that even though majority of Africans still do not have the access to basic health care, and millions of Africans in particular are unable to access or for the services that is needed to thrive and for survival um, without really you know, incurring financial hatch. The idea of achieving universal health coverage in Africa was perceived as something really far away, a distant dream. Um, but in this time that we're in, we believe that the tide is turning um, and we're quite hopeful. I said two publications because in 2016, there was another one called um, Universal Health Coverage in Africa, a framework action. And that publication suggested uh, that strong economic growth in recent years has helped reduce poverty in African countries to 43% of the population. Uh, yes, indeed, as Africa population continues to expand, it is estimated to reach 2.5 billion by 2050, with a fast increasing youth population. The region faces a critical challenge of creating the foundations of long-term inclusive growth. Uh, many African countries still contend with high levels of child and maternal mortality. Malnutrition is increasing by the day. Uh, most health systems are still unable to deal effectively with pandemics and epidemics. And the growing burden of chronic diseases uh, such as diabetes just continue to deepen. Um, and we say that the primary reason for investing in uh, uh, universal health coverage is beyond um, government responsibility, is a moral. It is just not acceptable that some members of society uh, face death um, directly, they face disability, they face ill health or impoverishment for reasons that could uh, be addressed at limited cost. Yeah. We think that w, uh, universal health coverage yeah. is a... Uh, Madam Moderator, are you able to address uh, the background noise, please? Thank you. 
Um, prevention of malnutrition and ill health is likely to have enormous benefits in terms of longer and more productive lives, higher earnings, and averted care costs. How then do we engage on, uh, our youth as equal partners? And to your question, how do we foster partnerships in advancing universal health coverage in Africa? Firstly, we need to uh, realize that Africa is the one continent with the youngest population world. Last year, in 2022, around 40% of the population was aged 15 years and younger, compared to a global average of 25%. Although the median age of the continent has been increasing annually, it still remains as low as around 20 years. And this tells us something. The global spread of the internet, the massive adoption of mobile devices, and the consolidation of social and entertainment online platforms have given rise to a digital economy. And with our youths, with access to requisite technology and skills, can participate, can engage, can be involved, can produce, and can use. Youth who are able to leverage such opportunities are now able to engage in capital enhancing activities, learn new skills, and create pathways to employment. And this just dovetails into health and healthcare. You see, for me, I believe that. Um, the youth of our times, actually, in quotes, uh, need to leverage more what you have um, in this age, which places you far above uh, those who are ahead of you in terms of technology. So participating and getting involved in advancing health is actually really a burden um, and the responsibility of the younger age who seems to you know, likely will be more around than the older generation. See, but the, the twist there is that the youth need to do the hard work, the hard work of creativity, innovation, reimagining the possible and solving complex problems, which unfortunately is a, is a situation of the healthcare in Africa. Statistically, we have the sustainable development goals was, you know, the targets and the indicators that can gear us and serve as a baseline um, and a monitoring and evaluation dashboard to be able to achieve universal health coverage in Africa. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I would like to just really chip in and talk about the public-private partnership and the necessity uh, for this model in Africa, unlike many other advanced nations, albeit they actually also deploy such models. I think peculiarly in Africa, and as a young generation um, that I believe that a large part of the audience represents, the need to recognize um, partnering with governments to solve Africa's health problem is quite inimical. It's important to the extent we run a risk of losing lives uh, if we don't realize on time how important this model is. Government still holds the responsibility of public health that impacts on the majority. So we're talking of percentages in the 90 uh, of health in Africa. Primary health care, uh, all of the health, averagely, of a human being, 70% of the health that we, that, we, that, that we are attended to is under primary health care, 70%, which is in the hands of the government. Therefore, it's just really important to take away that, you know, um, hand pointing and judging part and be able to look beyond to have real conversations that can advance health and make health as equal, as accessible, and as affordable as possible in Africa. I finalize by saying that 
critical scholars have gone as far as calling some of this health and non-health business practices exploitative due to the immense wealth generated and held by a handful of some people. We must realize that the fact that health is very capital intensive, um, a lot more is to be done in terms of our critical imaginations and thoughtfulness, as well as our innovative approach um, as a continent to addressing the challenges of our health and healthcare. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope we we'll have a fruitful uh, session ahead. Over. Thank you, uh, Dr. Toki, for that amazing uh, setting of the stage and reminding us of the fundamental, the role of young people, where we are at health coverage. Um, I think that's uh, a stellar way of starting out our discussion. Um, I'd like us to, I'd like us just to hold them um, till the end so that we can do the Q&A um, collectively. Um, so just note down what uh, question or comment that you have. Um, and I think moving on to our next uh, speaker, which, that is Dr. Mohamed El Sahili, the Chief Executive Officer of Medland uh, Hospital. And um, Dr. Sahili, maybe you could uh, highlight for us, um, especially with all these transitions and all these uh, huge uh, key documents coming out. We have the new public health order. We are at the moment of evaluating yeah, uh, with regards to UHC 2030. We also have the sustainable development goals that are, that are also in a process of evaluation. So this puts us in a lot of transition um, as a continent and also on the globe. As African transitions to actually affordable healthcare and health for all, how can we as a young people, given that we make up about 42% of the global youth uh, population by the year 2030, how can we then leverage our youthfulness and our innovation towards attaining health for all and be equal partners with regards to ensuring our health systems are more efficient? So over to you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, Marie-Claire. Uh, I hope that you hear me well. Yes, loud and clear. Um, be, be, um, let, me, let me start by saying that um, funding Africa's healthcare system is very essential to achieving an inclusive and long-term economic growth. Um, if we look at the uh, recent economic improvement, and as a result of that, the percentage of the people that are living in uh, poverty has dropped to 43%. However, on the other hand, building the infrastructure for sustainable, inclusive growth in Africa is becoming increasingly important as the continent's population uh, grows. The high rates of child and maternal mortality persist in many nations. Hunger is all too common. Most of the health systems are ill-equipped to combat ep epidemics and the increasing prevalence of chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, or uh, some of the cancer diseases. So in, in the face of these difficulties, efforts to implement the concept of UHC or universal health coverage in which all people have access to the healthcare they require without experiencing financial hardship, uh, logistical hardship, uh, infrastructural hardships, must be redoubled and uh, uh, actually hastened. The UHC is definitely a priority in the health plans of the vast majority of African nations, but progress, progress has been delayed in turning these promises into enhanced financial protection and fair and highly quality health services through effective development aid and increasing the domestic uh, health spending. You can see that weak public healthcare systems, difficulties in developing resilient healthcare systems, difficulties in, for example, financing, uh, financial risk protection, uh, difficulties in addressing the needs of an aging population and other related issues 
to governance and leadership are all factors that hinder progress toward the URC agenda. Strategies for achieving URC may vary depending on local circumstances and national discussion. And there is no, how to say, it, one size fits all solution. For example, we have experts in the field of family planning that have determined that this service is crucial to universal health care. Despite this, young people are often left out and uh, of those discussions um, about URC, either because their specific family planning needs aren't being addressed or because their ideas, views, talents, strength aren't being incorporated into URC's implementation. In my opinion, youth must be purposefully included in the URC agenda and actively participate in conversations about strengthening health systems, improving pandemic preparedness, stepping up quality healthcare for all, and access to better healthcare financing options in order to fully uphold the, the human right to equitable quality health services, including family planning. Now, one of the, uh, if I may call it challenges, uh, but at the same time, I think it's an opportunity. It's the fact that we have a, uh, a mandate um, to include youth that are not only or uh, strictly working in the healthcare field. What do I mean by that? If we really want to tackle or to address challenges that are related to financial risk, for example, it doesn't harm us to include youth that are active in the finance sector. The same applies to those who are in the infrastructure sector or the telecom sector. We have a mandate, an obligation to bring all youth together from different sectors. And this is why, for example, at Medland, we said, and we adopted this year, the hashtag of bridging with agility. We have a mandate and an obligation to be agile, to, to at the same time, to be innovative in our approach, to bring in all those youth ideas on the table. Some may work, some may not work, but we have to think outside the box. That is the only way where we can start saying very frankly, very transparently, that we have stopped doing sick care and now we are moving into real health care. Because that health care is our way to address uh, health issues at the very beginning of diseases, therefore an earlier diagnosis and therefore a, 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 a decreased health budget, national health budget. And this is our way to really move the preventative agenda forward so that we can plan if we are talking about uh, emergency preparedness or pandemic preparedness, we can really talk about that agenda so that we are ready for the next health emergency post the COVID-19 pandemic. I will end my keynotes here and I hope that this will, uh, will open the, the floor for further discussions and uh, many more ideas to bring on the table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. I think um, in the interest of uh, time, I think I'd like to change program a little bit and bring forward um, words from the floor. So for those of you who've been tuned in and probably you have a comment that you'd like to share on this topic or an insight you'd like to share, um, this is now the opportunity for you to share that insight. Um, yes, uh, I'll start off with uh, Lizzie Otai. And if you have an insight, you can raise your hand and I'll call you. Um, and if you would like to leave it on the comment, I can also, um, we can also read it out. So over to Lizzie. Thank you, Doc. Um, and I, I appreciate the comments uh, and the keynotes that have just been addressed by Dr. Maurice and um, Dr. Mohammed. Um, I like the fact that they've mentioned key points and, and what we know as ENASO being um, a regional body that looks at uh, civil societies and community groups within the health space is we've seen an abnormal relationship that has already been in existence within the health space, but hasn't really been given the keen eye. And, and um, I, I know Dr. Mohammed will conquer with this. It's the private-private partnerships. And this is where we are trying to also off-burden 
uh, the public space with achieving universal healthcare. But when we look at the 1.8 billion youth that we already have, we've also seen within the communities they do have the number. We do. They do actually have the numbers, and these numbers are what we can use in terms of achieving universal health care healthcare coverage. Now, in terms of uh, what, what I like when um, when Dr. Maurice was talking and bringing in the aspect of PPP, and I know how passionate she is, I just want to emphasize on the fact that we already have 1.8 billion youth within the uh, within the, uh, the the world itself. This is a global number, and this is a huge manpower that we need to figure out how we're going to tap into it. Uh, we're talking about eradication of diseases, uh, especially with the global fund we've seen, we're trying to eradicate um, HIV, TB, and malaria by 2030, and we're using the efforts uh, that the youth uh, the, the numbers that they have uh, in terms of, you know, just convening other youth, uh, influencing. We've seen the power of new media and the social media. We're also using the youth to champion for sexual reproductive health rights. So we've seen they can actually influence each other. And this, this number uh, is something that we're trying to take advantage of. And I'd also like to call out to every organization here to use this particular number. In, in order to just make healthcare better. And this is, is after COVID-19, we've learned so many things and we're shifting the discussions from, you know, um, leaving the youth out of the discussions, but bringing a table, a designated seat for them so that we can also understand what are the pain points or what needs to be done. So we need, we, we actually learned it the hard way. We've been making decisions for the youth for quite a long time, but it's time for them to also tell us what they expect as the youth and how we can achieve UHC uh, by 2030. So I'll just stop at that. My apologies again, I'm still trying to uh, look for um, acting ED and one CZ. I'm pretty sure he'll shed more light on this, but over to you, Doc. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for that, uh, Lizzie. I think uh, probably I'll hand over to Dr. Atoki and then Dr. Mohammed to give their views on the statement you've just made and then we can take another round of uh, questions. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand and I'll just note it, thanks. Dr. Mo, uh, do I have the floor? Yes, you do, Dr. Atoki. Over to you. All, all just right. Right. <laughs> My dear Boris. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Liz, um, for, for those comments. And I do, I'm, I must tell you, uh, from, from where I sit and what I see, um, I'm just going to tell you as it is, it's hard. It's hard for this PPPs to happen, um, even at the level of just really uh, getting the private sector to, you know, uh, engage with the public sector. It's hard, but it's doable. And that's what we should take away. It's doable, um, it's necessary, and it's the closest win that we have in terms of you know, where the opportunities really are. Um, and that's where as youth, uh, as a generation of youth, your tenacity and your grit uh, needs to be deepened. Uh, again, you're not dealing with categories of partners that are willing to, you know, either relinquish power or authority at any point in time. You're dealing with very audacious um, generations that have been in power for quite a while. Um, and like I said earlier, I mean, for me, if I were in your shoes as youth, I would use what I have most. And I know <laughs> as a statement of fact, that one thing the older generation don't have, that the youth have, is technology. There is no way they will ever have it as much as you do. And so they are waiting. They are waiting for you to guide. They are waiting for you to point the, into the right direction. They, they are waiting for you to explore and to innovate and to share ideas and so on and so forth. So I wish to see um, a use that, you know, becomes more audacious to really uh, address this expectation and realize what they have. The truth of the matter is that Africa is still at the place where we're nowhere near advanced countries in terms of really getting 
our monologue um, data, database of uh, records to that advanced um, technology level. And that is a place for the use. And when you do it, advocate. When you do it, make sure that you are as visible as possible. I think there's a lot of role that technology can play that we're not harnessing enough. Um, in the mind of the older generation, it's very likely that it, it, it could be costly, but as more and more advancement is given to digital technology, it gets cheaper, it gets more accessible. I mean, look at what is going on in social media. It's becoming more and more friendly and more and more useful and more and more, you know, it's changing the dynamics of times. And that's the one thing I think you guys can leverage to enhance whether PPP, whether funding, whether financing, whether the economics of health and so on and so forth. I mean, even just looking at data analytics and health, um, health uh, statistics, or, it's just really to think about what technology can bring to us uh, from the mind of the youth. It's by itself, it's, it's ex exploratory. And until we get, until we really take the bull by the horns and do what we need to do as a youthful generation, um, I'm not sure we're gonna move. And when I say do what we need to do, sometimes it can be hard. It can be just doing some things voluntarily, going to a hospital and tell them that, hey, I can help you with your database. Don't sit at home and say you don't have a job and be a programmer and programming, you know, um, just uh, social media stuff. Get into institutions and offer to help. Sometimes it takes that uh, step and that um, showcasing of your abilities to be able to identify you as problem solvers uh, indeed. I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mary, sorry to interrupt, but okay, our acting um, ED is here. So Nesmus is already on the call. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for that. Uh, maybe we can have um, Dr. Mohammed uh, comment on your, your statement, and then I'll take um, Kavin's, Kauma's uh, intervention, and then we can then come to just Mr. Uh, Mr. Onesmas uh, to give his presentation. So over to you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you. Um, just two comments are uh, because um, all what we are sharing here is is valid. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Morris that um, it is hard uh, to implement PPPs at this stage. Um, the one, maybe we can. Okay, I have been muted. Uh, anyway, it's fine. Moderator, can we please mute the others so that we can talk? Is it fine now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm saying that I agree with Dr. Mori, uh, Morris about the uh, that it is hard to implement from where we are today. It's hard to implement PPPs. Uh, one of the major challenges, in my opinion, is that the private sector uh, is segregated and they, the players or stakeholders, they do not communicate in between themselves so that they can be echoed in one voice when, when uh, partnering with the public sector. So it is very important to get rid of the competition mindset and to implement a colleagueship mindset within our uh, uh, entities, business uh, facilities, and then communicate together, come up with a plan, with a vision for the future, uh, a, a vision where we are all sharing not the same values, but at least values that are aligned. The other point that I wanted to, to highlight is that our definition of youth is different. Uh, we, we believe that youth is not limited to a uh, gender or to an age uh, category. We believe that youth 
a, a, is actually a definition of any individual with a hope for the future. You can be an 80 year old person that has just come up with an AI idea and therefore you do believe in the future for the generations to come. Um, so, so it is very important also to bring in everyone on that table. Um, yes, people who are in a uh, uh, in an age category between 20s and the 30s or 40s have a, a, a more important role to play um, from a longevity perspective, etc. But I truly believe that any idea has to be welcomed by the private sector so that it is brought to the attention of the public sector. Uh, we are not here to, to, to showcase who does it better. We are here to showcase who can preserve a, a better life for, the, for, uh, for our uh, youth, for the generations to come, and to try as much as we can to, uh, to give accessibility uh, to healthcare to everyone, uh, not as a, um, a, a, a sign or as a gesture of charity of kind or kindness, but rather that as a right to everyone. That will be my comments. And I think because I'm committed to another, uh, to another uh, call, uh, I, I think in a few minutes I will have to log off. So I apologize in advance. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mohammed. Um, in the interest of time, um, because you're about to leave, maybe I could um, ask Kavins to give his question in a minute, and then we can have um, Mr. Uh, Onesmas um, from uh, Enaso give his uh, presentation. So Kavins, uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the insights, Dr. Hari, and uh, it's a pleasure and a great privilege to have you with us uh, this afternoon. I just have two highlights, then a question. Um, I think the issues regarding UHC needs a lot of proactiveness rather than reactiveness. And also the most important uh, demographics here uh, and the most important uh, uh, agenda here should be the youth because the youth always have been sidelined in most of the activities. You get youth activities, but attended by people who are, if you, if, if you look critically, are not within that. But I really like the, the definition the, the doc has given about who is a youth from their perspective, any individual with a hope for the future. It may be good, it sounds good, but now on paper, on reality, when things are supposed to be done the right way, sometimes it may not uh, get there. But now, uh, two things that I want to highlight is that, um, towards uh, attaining UHC, uh, there is a, a platform that we have as a youth today, which is technology. We really, really need to leverage on that uh, uh, platform so that we can be able to be uh, able to get uh, the maximum number of youth participating in youth activities, youth agenda towards UHC, which I think would be very key. If you look at the global uh, perspective of how uh, the African, especially youth, uh, participate on online platform, on online activities. You find it amazing. So it's an, a platform that we can use to leverage. Uh, we can leverage on to, to, to get to this. And also, uh, there is need that we have, we equip and have capacity building for our research institute with uh, regards to health matters so that we may erase a few doubts and the shadows of doubt here and there with regards to other other other, other issues that may come from uh, foreign places. I, I would say this with a lot of caution so that I don't maybe injure somebody's uh, um, 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 reputation. But also uh, my, my question is one thing about the vaccines because you are looking at uh, all these documents that are geared towards universal health uh, uh, issues uh, about uh, Agenda 2063, uh, about uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. My question to the doc either would, would, would throw in their, their, their comment. Why do we have that uh, when we have vaccines from outside Africa, there have always been questions related to the same. When we have any um, health mitigating factor or measure, 
there are questions that are, are bound to be raised in one way or the other. What is it that is not adding up or what is it that may not be adding up when these vaccines are, are made or manufactured to come to Africa? Uh, there are things yes. that are, uh, are Mr. done. Mr. Cavins, you, you need to summarize in 10 seconds, please. I'm, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Thank you. All right, um, you'll just hold on for the response of your question. Um, I think let's give uh, Mr. Onesmas the floor to give his uh, intervention and then now we can take the answer to your question um, after this and also the next uh, intervention probably from the audience. So over to uh, Mr. Onesmas. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I hope I'm laudable. Yes, you are. You can hear me. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is an extremely important conversation when we are talking about UHC and the youth and the prevailing health environment today. For a long time, we have held the adage that youth are leaders of tomorrow. But I think today we need to say you are the leaders of today because that tomorrow we have been waiting for is now. Why am I actually saying this? I'm saying this because youth carry the future of the next generation communication. They set the agenda. Today, the youth have such a strong mobilizing power and are able to ensure that innovations that can save a life reach a multitude of people within a short period of time using the power of social media. There has been, for instance, a lot of miscommunication and false information, especially where we have new innovations coming into place. Think about the just recently peak of COVID-19 pandemic, where there was a lot of misinformation that was going around through the social media and through other forms of the media. This was a perfect example that we should actually have used the youth platform and its innovation in social media to disarm the negative messages that were going out and passed the right message that would have actually enhanced access to medical countermeasures for COVID-19. I say that youth are actually at the center of the next generation universal health coverage interventions because they actually are driving the health agenda today. So I think uh, we, 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 we stand very strategic to create more youth champions in UHC because they can, we can leverage one on their multitude in numbers. If you look at the global South today, we are talking in reality when it comes into age specifics, over 60% are actually youth. So you can imagine that mass of youthful age galvanizing together and pushing the right message then would actually tip over the, the effects of universal health coverage interventions probably in a shorter period of time. So I really do think that this is the right time to put this conversation on the table to ensure that youth take the rightful space in moderating, engaging, and shaping the conversation on universal health coverage because they have the numbers, they have the technology, today, which is actually getting into sharing the right information and communication so that we can actually be able to move on into the next, next stage. So I, I know some of the questions that have been asked here, my colleagues will actually respond to them, but I think youth are actually holding the key. Most, most of the age group we are talking about is a learned group. Most of the age group we are talking about is techno savvy and should actually be able to discern hearsay and the right information that we need to pass across. So let's build youth champions. Let's provide them the avenue to ensure that we communicate the right message so that we can foster UHC in the next generation. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I know um, this is a very uh, useful conversation. I would have loved to stay in and, and actually listening to and contribute to, 
but uh, uh, I, I, I just uh, like uh, my fellow predecessor, I'll just be jumping into another meeting, but I just want to say this is the right direction that we need to take. Let's put youth at the center of UH3 sport response and take advantage of technology and the multitude of numbers that they have to make a difference. Thank you very much. Great. Um, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Onesmus. I think um, just before you log off, maybe I could hand over to you to give a, cap a brief uh, caption on what uh, Cavins was commenting on. Um, and then now I'll hand over to Fidelia to give her intervention and also the power minutes since we are now at that part of the program. Um, so maybe okay. over Thank you very much. So uh, you want me to briefly respond to what Calvin was talking about? Yes. That, thank you. And, and um, listening to Calvin, I, I think uh, th those are, are quite uh, um, genuine concerns that you're putting on the table. But I think when we are talking about investing on the youth and you are mentioning uh, on your last statements, well, well, what's happening? For instance, vaccine that are coming to Africa, and then you have all this information that's coming around. And I was reading the 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 kind of alarming information sometimes that reaches us that uh, uh, probably the vaccines are not good or something like that. This was done for Africa. I do not think that um, really the world can actually have a conspiracy towards Africa. Besides. Africa has its institutions that verify to ensure that vaccines that come to Africa are actually vaccines that are appropriate and actually are certified. It's not like Africa doesn't have a uh, scientist. That's why we have Africa CDC. We have all these other institutions, including at the country level. When these vaccines come in or any other medical countermeasures come into our countries, our scientists have the role to actually check that this is actually a, a good, it meets the standards so that it can be used. So we have had a lot of hearsay. And, and you saw this during COVID-19. There was a lot of false information. You take the vaccine on your arm, you put a nail or a spoon, it will stick on your arm. How many nails and spoons have stuck on our arm since we took the vaccine? That was purely not the right information to go out there. So I think as youth, with our power of mobilization, with our power of reaching and sending the right messages through the right information platforms that we have. We should be able to discern what is hearsay. We should be able to pick the right information and ensure that it is well communicated so that our people do not miss life-saving interventions because of wrong information that is going out there. That's probably what I would want to say. Thank you very much. And that's why we are building youth champions today for COVID-19 pandemic preparedness and UHC. Um, thank you so moderator if i can just chime in a, a few words and i really yes. want to um the, the 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 viewpoint of the last speaker mr onesmos yes kalama um i also just want to say that in addition to what he said and and before we you know really cast aspersions and uh, do the judging game we must have information like he pointed out uh, the thing really is not as, you know, say oh, this, they're coming to dump these vaccines in Africa. That's not the truth. Another fundamental thing that I heard, you know, in some of these um, um, health seminars that, that I've attended, which has really helped my education level, is also that a lot of Africans don't show at clinical trials. I don't know whether because of the taboos or the, you know, uh, superstitions, and therefore we're not carried along like every other nationality, like every other you know, um, ethnic uh, group. Uh, and so as youths, be aware, um, because when they do this clinical trial, they also have to you know, kind of um, ensure that the vaccines, the medications are suitable for the usefulness and the treatment for Africans. So what is really happening right now is that we consume um, medicines, pharmaceutical um, supplies, that have been tried and tested for non-Africans. And the same thing goes for vaccines. I mean, sometimes it works, um, but because it's not uh, um, completely ours and we're not involved because we don't, because it's a voluntary thing. We don't volunteer, it's, it's an open, <laughs> it's usually an open call. We don't show up and we don't, we don't volunteer for clinical trials. 
And so sometimes part of the fault is ours. So being aware is really quite important. And so that we don't just you know, conclude um, that uh, the white man is not doing what he ought to do. Over, thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Atoki. You really left us with something to ponder about um, on also other avenues of engagement. I think um, I'd like to give the floor to Fidelia Mwambi, um, who's a health strategist, um, to give her intervention and also probably we could kill two birds with one stone and she gives the power minutes. So over to you. Thank you, Marie-Claire. I hope I'm clear and uh, audible from your side. Yes. Um, so, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Morris. Um, I, I I really do appreciate uh, what you what you have said about the private partnerships and how the difficult the challenges that you face, and also really do appreciate what uh, Dr. Sahili and uh, Mr. Onesmas have said when it comes to youth leveraging on the technology and the innovations, which is true, the youth are the largest numbers, just not in Africa, but globally as well. But um, I would like to shift the narrative a little bit and shake it up because uh, most people are looking at it and this is what the youth have. And uh, perhaps I can say, um, and Dr. Maurice, you can actually um, expound more on this and give your insights as a, um, as a, uh, based on your experience that the youth, um, they do, is it, you see, we always talk about the youth being uh, accelerators to the UHC and advancing in UHC. But yes, they have the technology, they have the internet coverage, and yes, they do have the innovations and the numbers are good because it's cause, it can cause a movement which can actually drive a change. But the truth is that uh, in some, in sub-Saharan Africa, and I think some parts of Africa, the youth do not find that platform to be easy to be able to engage people who can actually influence and uh, give them the give them the platform to be able to share out their views. Because most of the time, when you look at the UHC, uh, we don't look at it in terms of what other in, what what are the other indirect factors that affect them that are barriers when it comes to them accelerating UHC. Uh, currently, right now, globally, it's not just in Africa or East Africa. We are facing um, we are facing um, a, a, a rise in living cost of living, and that affects the social and economic uh, determinants, which also impacts their ability to um, accelerate healthcare. So my thing is uh, how. We, we need to look at the, the youth and, and understand what exactly is it that they are facing? What are the under, underpinning and, and factors that have not been brought to light that are actually inhibiting them from accelerating UHC? Do they have the basic understanding of what UHC is? Because we are also looking at the literacy levels and access to education and not just education itself, also public health education. Do they really do understand what UHC is, what the benefits is? Do we have champions as what um, Mr. Onesmas was talking about? Do we have these peer, uh, peer educators who are going to help shape the behavioral change and shift the culture from having a point, from a point of ignorance and assumption to where they learn and learn and continue to learn what UHC is, the benefits of UHC, and how they can do it from the grassroots levels, because we are looking at it as a community. If you look at it as a whole, it all starts with the bottom part, and that the, 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 the bottom part is uh, the family unit, the community, the society. So the youth at that level are the only ones who can actually um, build a camaraderie, which will actually be the driving force to accelerate UHC. So I, I would like to know from you, Dr. From new Dr. Maurice and um, my my fellow, the other participants, what is it? What has been the experience when working with the youth in ask in, towards accelerating UHC? What are the grassroots? What are they doing from the? What what is being done at the grassroots level, or what is needed to be done from the grassroots level that will change the narrative of? Um, the youth being the accelerators to them just doing it, taking on in the responsibility to driving the UHC itself by themselves. And um, 
the other thing I would like to know is how, why is, um, and Dr. Maurice, sorry for putting you on the limelight again, but we've been, ha there's have been conversations about UHC and I understand the different levels of um, leadership. But then again, um, these, we, you can't, even I, as a youth, I'm not able to have access to what these conventions are all about. Like last, I think they, uh, in, um, I, was just, I saw a post by Dr. Gidinji Gitahi where they were, they, they were having new conversations at the UN, I think it's in New York or Washington, about GHC. And I really wanted to know what is it ha that they have said that they want to change? And did they have an input from the youth with, from every part of the world? Or is there a representative, youth representatives from Africa in the different sectors, like be it in Southern, Eastern, what is it that, how, how can we as youth or we as the young stakeholders in healthcare have access to that? Because by accessing that, we, we are able to access information that you can share and cascade to the others. So those are the sort of barriers that I'm also speaking about. And um, I think for the youth themselves, ownership and understanding the, the importance of healthcare and um, paying premiums to the National Health Insurance Fund is also a step to ensuring that there's a culture of um, ensuring that they are catered, they, they are protected health ways and they, they have financial protection so that if they're ill, uh, they will not be able to face financial catastrophe. That is one thing that I would like to leave everybody with, that it is upon ourselves to take it as our responsibility to own our health and also ensure that we build that culture of paying, of um, subscribing to national healthcare insurance uh, health and so that you can be able to access healthcare. And this is just not curative healthcare, but promotive and preventative care. That's it from my side. Um, it's a Mar Mar Claire, do I have your permission to go ahead? Yes, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Okay, so um, Dr. Fidila, it's a pleasure to hear you. Um, I can tell from listening that you're quite um, knowledgeable. And I think that you've answered a lot of the questions you raised yourself. Um, but in terms of the platform, and I'll, I'll re-echo some of the things I said before. I do agree with you um, that some of those platforms are not accessible. Uh, yeah, but again, you see, it's not a use thing not to be able to access. And I'm not sure Dr. Mo can be a witness. We meet each other in some of this. So we, we, we're acquainted, myself and Dr. Mo, coincidentally. Lisa will, will know that because I think she's partly instrumental to that. Um, but we meet each other at different international platforms. You know why? It's not because they were accessible. It's because we put ourselves out there aggressively. You want to be heard? You need to be out there and you need to do that work. If you feel you have something that is meaningful for the world, for the continent of Africa, to attend to and to listen to you, nobody's gonna bring it to your house. Nobody's gonna bring it to your office. No platform is gonna come on a platter of gold. You need to go there. You need to be persistent. You need to lay your claim. You need to write your, <laughs> you need to push your concepts and you need to do it not once, not twice. You need to do it as often as it takes until somebody calls you. It's not a youth thing, it's a human thing. And so unfortunately, what I've also realized that um, the concept of medicine or health by itself is so technical and so demanding that there's a very high likelihood um, that more often than not, um, most health workers or people just get in the health direction are consumed by that, you know, um, technical aspect. And to forget the social and the soft elements of, you know, the advocacy, the drive, um, the tenacity, the just being um, determined and rugged in the face of hardship. That's the, one of the important aspects of, of growth, especially in a place like Africa. Uh, unfortunately, people, these things are not thought in school, you know, they're never taught at home. 
It's just you really realizing what the society demands. And maybe if you're in an advanced environment, um, it might not be so uh, of a matter of requirement from you. Um, therefore, what I will say to an average youth or an average human being that is here that is aspiring to be heard is you need to do the work. And that work is not you just knowing the basics or the complexities, it's you striving to be heard on those things that you know. Uh, I wouldn't take much of your time, I would end it there. Hold on. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Toki. And I think I'll just add on a bit to the observation on the high level meeting on UHC, TB, and, and pandemic preparedness and response that happened last week um, in New York at the United Nations headquarters. Um, I think I think one key thing that um, was observed was there were very few people who, few young people who are part of the delegations, um, but a good number of young people did give statements um, such as from the International Federation of Medical Student Association, um, a couple of young people and youth-led organizations did get input into statements that were read during the week. But in terms of visibility, I mean, the young people are the minority. So I think that's more food for thought, uh, given that we're headed into another series of high-level meeting with the World Health Assembly starting on Sunday. Um, there's the other U UHC high-level meeting in September. There's a conference for public health in Africa in November. So it will be interesting to, to see how many young people engage on such platforms. But we also need to have hope, um, as it was said, at the 2023 Africa Health Agenda International Conference. Um, things may fall apart, but uh, hope, leave it, hope lives eternal. So we need to have hope. And I think the establishment of the Youth Advisory Team for Health by the Africa CDC is a good first step. So it's now seeing how do we plug into such structures. Uh, with that said, I'd like to hand over to Collins, uh, maybe to take us through, is it the call to action? Um, and also guide us on the next steps. Um, and then um, we can call it a, an afternoon. So probably um, over to you, Collins, to guide us on the next uh, part of the agenda. Thank you, Mary Claire. Uh, Robin, Robinson is going to take us through call to action. Uh, thank you, Dr. Terry. It has been a very wonderful engagement, a very wonderful discussion. And uh, from what I'm picking from the discussion is that youth are at the center stage of universal, universal health care. And there's need to have the understanding, need to have them uh, have the understanding of the universal care for the benefit and also to be champions in this. And therefore, uh, as key stakeholders and key partners in this, we need to create a platform for the youth where they can, they can share and also leverage on the available available technology and available space where they can be able to not only just learn but also uh, improve on awareness and therefore as YIDP we are, we are in a mission to lead a charge for public uh, uh, public private collaboration that can be able to open up opportunities for the underprivileged youths uh, so that they, be, they can be able to be aware and also be able to be the champions of the uh, universal healthcare. And therefore, we are calling upon key stakeholders as this is a journey that requires uh, the participation of different stakeholders from different high levels, uh, which of course are all available here. We need this uh, from, we need your help to make this a success. And we are calling upon the stakeholders in this forum and beyond to join forces with us today and let's create a brighter. Uh, and an environment for the youth where all the youth feel part and are aware of the universal healthcare. I think to that end, I'll hand it back to Collins.
Yeah, thank you, Robinson, for that. I really appreciate the conversation and the importance of uh, the UHC and how we can collaborate with different stakeholders uh, to ensuring that they use. The youth are at forefront and uh, we all work collaboratively to advance and accelerate UHC in our communities. So it is true that there is need for collaboration and because of economic uh, challenges that the youth are facing, sometimes uh, they are bad uh, towards uh, accelerating that. So because of this reason, uh, we have an upcoming event and we'll have a session uh, for UHC and the role of the UHC in accelerating, uh, the role of the youth in accelerating the UHC. So we are uh, welcoming you uh, to come on board to collaborate with us, partner with us, join the discussion. We'll have different stakeholders together with the youth. Sometimes it's good to hear from the youth. And also it's good to hear from different experts that will give their views in different angle. So we have a convention coming up uh, uh, on, on, on 10th and 11th of August. So feel free to reach out to us for strategic partnership or sponsorship. So we also have a, a post uh, convention, which is very important. Uh, we really think uh, mental and physical health for everyone, not only the youth is key. So it's high time in our work environment, in our schools, in our homes, we come together and uh, sensitize the importance of uh, having this and uh, people being aware of the situation of the mental illness that we have in our community or in, our, in Africa today. So feel free to reach out to us for an engagement so that we collaborate in uh, realization of this. So, I'll hand over to Mary Claire to address the question in the chat box, which is very important. I've seen, I've seen so many important questions that are useful because there is still time. So maybe you can just run over them and then we see, we, we wrap up for today. Thank you. Over to you, Mary Claire. All right, um, thank you, um, Collins. Mm. So I think um, one of the key questions that I caught was, just give me a minute, um, by Jovian K. Within the grassroots, the youths are very adamant in taking up NHIF and UHC because they feel that the current status of the economy is limiting. Uh, proper education on the importance of UHC and NHIF is key because Health is an investment within also the grassroots. Most young mothers who really need UHC and NFHIF are not of age, meaning they miss the benefits and go through challenges within clinics or healthcare services. Um, so the question he had was, as we fight to curb teenage pregnancies, how can these teens who are already who already are expectant and have babies benefit from UHC and NHIF? when already in age they can't register. Uh, yes, I think that's the main, the main question that I caught. Um, the rest were more of introductions. So yes, I don't know who is willing to uh, take this question on teenage pregnancy and the lack of health insurance being able to cover them. Um, probably Kenyan from the floor, but also Maybe Dr. Atoki, you could give us your insights on how is teenage pregnancy covered with regards to health insurance, uh, where you're based. Thank you. So we could start with Dr. Atoki as we wait from back on the floor. Hmm. Thank you, Mary Curry. Mary Claire, Dr. Mary Claire. I think I'm the only panelist uh, still here. So <laughs> perhaps based on that, um, I'll, I'll... Uh, take the question. Um, I think generally, like uh, multiple uh, um, cases uh, across the demographics, teenagers, um, especially teenage pregnancy, 
uh, is largely impacted um, as far as um, the risk, um, inaccessibility and affordability uh, to health and healthcare, especially at primary uh, health care level is concerned. Uh, for me, and I like the twist of the question because it sounds like uh, we're talking about existing pregnancies. Um, on the contrary, I will start with uh, education. I do largely think that a lot of advocacy on educating uh, the teenagers, um, the younger ones, about protection, um, about their rights, rights to you know to their bodies and so on and so forth, um, and about you know things like uh, um, all of the diseases uh, that emanate from you know very young pregnancies. Just letting them be aware and know that the reason why we shouldn't carelessly be engaged, you know, in a uh, insect out, outside of marriage, you know, maybe young, young, young pregnancies as well, young marriages is really important. And at a grassroots level, I think that we take priority over uh, even before, you know, they, they get pregnant. In terms of um, accessibility, so, I'm not sure there is uh, a caveat or some level of uh, a pool for them provided for under universal health coverage. Um, I think it's generally a maternal health. Maternal means, you know, a mother. Um, new maternal, neonatal, and child health. So whether they're teenagers, whether they're not of age, whether they are of age, um, they will. Uh, access will still be the same struggle. So I think generally just educating them in the advocacies at grassroots level um, is empirical, is important, um, and is essential to be able to uh, capture that demography um, as far as universal health coverage is concerned. Thank you so much uh, for that intervention, uh, Dr. Toki. Um, I think it's, it's definitely something worth us thinking about. Um, so I think I'll hand over back to Collins because I don't see any other question. Um, but I think from my end, it's been, thank you for being with us and being in this, in this discussion. So over to, I guess, uh, either Robinson or um, um, Collins to take us through the final conclusion. And thank you also for taking time off your afternoon to be part of this round table. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Claire, for that wonderful moderation. And thank you uh, to all uh, participants, all the stakeholders who've joined us today. It was a wonderful engagement. I think we've learned a lot and what from my side, what I've carried uh, with me is that uh, youths or the young, the young generation are a center stage in championing the universal healthcare. And therefore, at this point in time, on behalf of, um, on behalf of uh, YIDP, I'd like to say a very big thank you to all of you who've attended. We are very grateful. In regards to reaching out to us, reaching out to us, uh, our contacts are here. You can reach us uh, through that uh, email address, partnership at yidpk.org, uh, or you can also get to learn more about uh, YIDP through that uh, website. We are very grateful and we are looking forward to uh, partnering with, with you and also looking forward to meeting you uh, in future engagements that we'll be undertaking. Therefore, I'm very grateful and at this particular moment, I will say that uh, everyone is at pleasure uh, to leave. So we are very grateful. Thank you.